Welcome to NAB Lab. My name is Tom Wiesegang and I'm an artist and co-founder of New Art Bird. NAB is a non-profit artist coalition that celebrates and promotes art that confronts injustice. And injustice comes in many forms, whether it be personal, social, political, or environmental. Our objective is to unite artists worldwide under one umbrella. Artists whose work responds to and confronts some of the most vexing issues of our times. We are based in Newburgh and we'll be launching a series of programs to benefit our local community. We see Newburgh as a burgeoning arts community and NAB will play a key role in its future development. NAB Lab is the first of our series of free lectures because we believe education should be available to all and not just to those who can afford it. As an art movement, NAB is not identified within the parameters of intellectual dogma or stylistic aesthetics. We are reactionary, topical, and committed to the raising of awareness through the power of art, because art is the universal language of the soul. We find ourselves living in troubling times. With the election of Donald Trump, democracies worldwide in decline, in our global environment, our beautiful Mother Earth, screaming out in pain, we stand at a threshold in human history never seen before. Besides the environmental concerns, the American dream has become a myth. The mass migration of peoples worldwide is of epic proportions, and money is the new god to be worshipped. Opioid-related deaths have surpassed automobile fatalities in the U.S. as a leading cause of accidental death. We all know what the issues are, and we all feel the anxiety. Change needs to happen. It needs to happen fast. We firmly believe art has the power to affect change, and it springs from the grassroots. We can no longer depend on inept political systems. Organizations such as NAB, C4AA, NGOs, environmental groups, churches, and nonprofits, large and small, around the world create a barrier, a pushback against what seems to be a tsunami headed our way. Our survival is not threatened as a species, rather we are threatened as a human family. But let us not lose hope. It is especially encouraging to see school kids internationally standing up in the fight against global warming. That is proactive involvement, and we can all play a part in it. Our guest speaker tonight will touch on that very subject, because alone, we feel helpless but together we feel empowered. There's a few people I'd like to acknowledge before we introduce our guest. Some very talented people made that happen. First and foremost, to artist and co-founder Whitney Clare, who built the platform on which we now stand. And especially to Annie McCurdy, our communications director. Josette Romnani, who played a key role in our strategic planning. Austin Dubois, Nicole Michaud, Brian Wolf, Katharina Moyens, Edward Emery, and all those who encourage and support our vision. At the end of the presentation tonight, we'll open the floor for your Q&A. If anybody wants to get involved in that, please let us know. I have one announcement I'd like to make before I introduce our guest. Our next speaker will be Janet Ron Reynitz, who is an artist of New Art Brute. She will be speaking at Aquinas Hall at Mount St. Mary College, November 14th, 6 p.m. She was one of the uh, original Freedom Riders from 1961. And that should be a great talk. So, without any further ado, let's introduce our guest this evening. Stephen Lambert is a co-founder of C4AA, or Center for Autistic Activism, it's based out of New York. He's also an artist and his work has been seen and felt internationally. In 2011, he built a 20-foot sign that says, Capitalism works for me. It allowed passerbys to vote true or false in a tour across the United States. He was invited to the UN to speak about his research on advertising of, advertising's effect on cultural rights. He was a senior fellow at New York's IBM Center for Art and Technology from 2006 to 2010. He has taught at Parsons the New School, Hunter College, the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, 
and is now a tenured professor of new media at SUNY Purchase in New York City. Steve has devoted his life to be of service to others, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Stephen Lambert. So there's a story about um, in Manchester when the Sucker Pistols first, the only time they played in Manchester. And uh, it's in the movie 24 Hour Party People. If you ever see it, there's a scene where the, the, um, the show Manchester happens. And everyone at that show like went on, there were very few people there at the show, but everyone that was at the show like went on to do these amazing things. So there's that. Um, <laughs> so the Center for Artistic Activism, we, uh, we are trying to change the way that activism is done worldwide. We got started um, when Steve Duncombe and I started to get together and uh, talked about creating a school. We had been started doing research, which I'll explain in a second, but um, Steve and I worked for a while, and then Rebecca joined us. Um, she left the Smithsonian to join the center, which was a great honor. Um, and Rebecca was actually there in the beginning, too, and we, were, we started doing research. And what we wanted to do was to figure out if art that, combining art with activism actually worked, if it did anything. We had a hunch that it did, but we were skeptical. And, um, and we wanted to know if we were just kind of fooling ourselves. And then if it did work, how did it work, right? Um, so at the prompting of this woman in the middle, Pat Gerardo, who is our um, board president, she encouraged us to turn this research into a workshop. And so we did, and that was some, uh, maybe eight years ago. Um, and since then, we've worked in, we've done over 30 workshops. I think the countries are higher now. Um, it's more than 14, but um, four continents, over a thousand participants, it's probably around 1,500 now, and we're in our 10th year. Um, these are some of the issues that we've worked on. So um, the issues often are very important to the people that we're working on, but of course I don't have experience with, with personal experience with all of these things. Um, some of them, but not all for sure. Um, and we try to um, help them move those issues forward by using creativity and culture, right? So we work with activists in these countries and artists. Um, I'm gonna go back just, just for that photo. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, we work with activists to help them sort of be more creative and we work with artists to help them be more effective, right? And uh, if you're training as an activist, you might study political science or something, but you're your experience in culture is like as a lay person, like right? someone who goes and does stuff or goes out to shows or um, experiences culture, and maybe you make it because you have a hobby at home but you have no training, right? And it seems sort of mysterious and opaque as to how that happens. Uh, for the activists, or for the artists, um, you're trained in the arts but not really how to actually affect culture and how change happens and how people um, change their behavior and their thinking, which is like a, a part of, um, it comes from other fields like psychology and stuff. So anyway, I'm already getting, getting into what is artistic activism. So I'll go through this really quick. We have our, we actually started using this term about 10 years ago and it's always nice to see it pop up um, because 10 years ago we chose it because no one was using it. <laughs> Um, so activism, you know, uh, generally activism has to deal with outcomes and effect. Um, so what, we're trying to get something done, we're trying to get a law passed or stop the law from happening or change a policy or get a politician out of office, for example. Um, and with art, the outcome is often about effect, about feeling, about a story or about moving someone to a sort of more um, contemplative place, right? And so Steve Duncan, uh, a more academic guy uh, in the group, was like, we should start talking about affective effect. And then he started saying effective affect. Effect, yeah, effective affect. 
it was really hard for me to even just say this without stumbling over it. And I was like, this is too hard to say, and it's too, it doesn't make it, it doesn't make it make more sense. As long as we're gonna do this, we should make it an even weirder word. So we came up with effect, which is a combination of affect and effect, right? So we want to get something done, and we're looking for an outcome, and we know that we need to use emotions to get to that outcome. So we consider these things kind of on a, on a spectrum. On the one side, we've got affect, on the other side, you've got effect, and we're, we're trying to do is something that lands in the middle. And I think to best explain what we mean by artistic activism is to talk about what's too far on either side. I think it just makes more sense to talk about the extremes. So first we'll go over to the affect side, and um, this is uh, the artist Richard Serra. He's like a pretty well-known artist. Um, he's generally a pretty happy guy. Um, you probably, his work is in the Dia Beacon. There's a big room of his tilted arcs, right? So Richard Serra, mostly happy. Um, when he found out about the Abu Ghraib prison scandal, he was not happy, <laughs> and um, he made this artwork. And so this artwork, you can tell he, what the emotions are, right? There, he's angry. You can see it in the lines. You can see it in the way he's like digging into the paper. And if you weren't sure what he was angry about, he drew the prison scandal and then wrote at the top, just in case, stop push, right? So um, this is what we call um, political expressionism, right? So Richard Serra expresses all kinds of things through artwork. He, if you ever see him, most times he's drawing. He constantly, he's constantly drawing. And he considers art a way of sort of processing his own thoughts and ideas and expressing things, right? And he had ideas about politics, and he used his art form to express his feelings and his ideas about politics. And this is good. It's, it's good that artists do this. There's a place for it. But it's not what we're concerned with when we talk about artistic activism. Um, because any political impact from this is not planned, it's not strategic. He's just mad and he's like making a drawing about what he's mad about. Um, and so the, if there is any political impact, it's kind of coincidental, it comes after the fact, it's, it's lucky, right? And what we want, and this is actually most political art, is political expressionism. It's artists who, who are making artwork about politics instead of making artwork that's trying to impact or affect or change power, right? Um, so again, I can defend this, I can talk about how great it is and why we need it, but it's not what we mean when we say artistic activism, and it's a kind of separate thing. Um, so on this other side is effect, and if you've, you're an artist, this has probably happened to you. So this is an image of a protest. Um, it's an anti-war protest, and what some artists have done is they made different elements of Picasso's Guernica, and then at different points in the protest, they would come together and make the most famous anti-war image, right? And then they would break up again. And um, so this works, it makes the protest more fun and, and more interesting. It's definitely more photog photogenic than these. These are more direct, these are important too, but this adds to it, right? Um, this is good, it's, there's a place for it. It's important, but it is not what we mean when we say artistic activism. We call this um, faux finish politics, right? So the idea is you've got a political action already crafted. We're going to do a march. We're going to deliver this petition. That plan is done. And then we call the artists and say, can you make a poster? Can you make this more pretty? And so it's like adding this pretty layer of icing on a cake that's already made. And what we mean when we talk about artistic activism is bringing the creativity into the process so that the creativity is baked into the action. And maybe you never do a march because you've come up with something different, because you've been thinking about other options the whole time. So anyway, this is where we land when we talk about artistic activism. Um, and when there's a balance in this one, it works really well. Arts incorporated from the level of tactics, the actions that you do, but also um, the objectives of what you're trying to accomplish, the vision, the goals, the bigger long-term thing, and, um, and the strategy, the way you're approaching it. It's a creative strategy. So um, you might be thinking, but Steve, 
outcomes, right? Like art and activism, they are different things. They don't go together. Um, doesn't what you're talking about sort of instrumentalize art, take something that should be about free expression and make it real, you know, about accomplishing something specific and that puts um, boundaries on art. Um, art needs to be free. Art needs to be able to, you know, do whatever you want to do and, and not be tied to these kinds of outcomes. And I would say to you that artists are already instrumentalized and what we recognize as contemporary fine art um, has already navigated, like the things you see in museums, get to museums because they have figured out how to navigate a commercial system that includes critics and dealers and buyers and international art fairs and sales. And as an artist, I've experienced this stuff in a way that most people haven't and I find it disturbing and disgusting. You just have to take my word for it if you haven't been to an international art fair. Um, but success in the world of fine art, where we think of like, you know, artists are the most free to do whatever they want, or art, art that's not about politics actually is embedded in a whole other political and economic system that we just don't recognize because it's been maintained for so long. Um, so, and it has these other metrics and outcomes that it's concerned with, like who's collecting your work, where is it showing, what are the venues, who's buying it, who are your collectors, what institutions are you in, what are the number of um, editions that you're making and how many have they sold and how much have they sold for? We take, as artists, going through art school, all that stuff is taken for granted. And those are systems of power and, and economics and, and politics that um, we kind of just refuse to see. So I would argue instead that art and activism have always worked together. They've always gone together. Um, and, and capital has really sort of worked really hard to cleave art and activism and separate them and they, there's a constant maintenance that needs to be done to separate art and activism and to say no 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 this is this and this is this and these are separate things and yes oh this is an unusual time when they happen to come together but normally they don't go together um, and this work is not political this is an artwork and this is political right this is political art that's a separate thing that's an anomaly so anyway you might be thinking like okay what do you mean like what what is an example of stuff that's always gone together. And if it's always gone together, how does it work? So I have tons of examples. Like I could show you a dozen things going back to like BC, you know, like um, the Prophet Muhammad as a poet and a singer and the, and the effect of that message and what happened, how it worked, or Jesus as a, Jesus of Nazareth as a performance artist and a poet, also, you know, incredibly effective. Um, to the first suffragettes and the costumes that they wore and the um, spectacles that they did as their protests on their marches on DC, but like I could go on. Anyway, this is the Diggers. The Diggers were a theater group in San Francisco in the early 60s. And they were a theater group that said, we're kind of very limited by the theater. Like people have to come into a venue and they have to come in to see our show and then it can only happen within the theater and what if we went outside the theater um, and so they also it's funny they got a hold of a copy machine um, there's not a lot written about this but they were this is like mid 1960s so a copy machine is this giant very expensive machine i don't know how they got a hold of it but they're like we can make photocopies you know so they started making all these publications and one of them was an outline for a free city and the free city had I have a plan for like almost everything, from car repair to a communication network, free food, um, free bank where free money would be issued. Be like you didn't put your money in it, you went there and you got money. Um, free legal assistance, and it went on. It's like a two-page document. Um, free housing, free workspaces, free stores, free workshops, free medical care, free hospitals free farms, free transportation, free radio, TV, and um, computer stations, and free music festivals, free schools, free news, and then these planning committees that would work on it. So they like thought it through. And it's a little fantastic, it's a little, um, you know, you might be thinking like, okay, it's a bunch of San Francisco hippies, and they're high, and they're like, uh, they have a photocopy machine, and they're like, what if we did all this free stuff? Um, but you'd be wrong, because, that's actually amazing that they made it this whole plan, right? Like, that's an accomplishment. And then they did it. 
Like they actually did a lot of these things. So with their photocopy machine, one day they figured out that the supermarket was throwing out a bunch of lettuce because it was gonna go bad. It wasn't bad yet, but they couldn't sell it. And so they made these photocopies and they said, today, right now, <laughs> 100 cases of lettuce free in the panhandle. Come, you know, we'll give you this, this lettuce. And they would do this. They would get a hold of free food and hand it out in a park. And um, this is, here they're making sandwiches. And when you come to do this, one of the things they did is they built this giant wooden frame that they called the free frame of reference. <laughs> and to get the free food, you had to step through the free frame of reference. Then you could get the food, and then you, you, everything was free the, once you passed through the threshold. But then you had to leave, and you had to go out through the free frame of reference back into the world where there was money and pay and costs and all that stuff. So handing out free food in the park, it seems super simple, but this started something else, which became um, Food Not Bombs, which continues to this day nationwide. Um, they, it also turned into another thing, of, another one of their projects, which they called the food conspiracy. And the food conspiracy was that they would go and buy food in bulk from farmers and then sell it at cost. So it wasn't really a conspiracy, but they just had a sense of humor. Um, and they knew that they were going to be called communists, so they're like, we'll just call it the food conspiracy. We're buying food from farmers, yeah. So they ran this all in um, private homes, and they were participating families that would pool their resources, they would buy all the stuff, they'd set up in a garage, and from what I've heard, you would go in, pick all the food that you want, and then they would weigh the food, not the individual, like, okay, so your beef is this much, and the salad is this much, like, per pound. They would weigh all of it and charge one price per pound for everything, which I don't know how that works, but, um, Anyway, it eventually got too big where they couldn't run it out of garages anymore, so they bought this warehouse um, and they called it the San Francisco Cooperating Warehouse. And they bought and sold food to members. And then that turned into a small cooperative grocery store in San Francisco, which eventually became a much bigger cooperative grocery store called the Rainbow Grocery Co-op. And this concept, the food conspiracy, spread across the country as well. And so most food co-ops are descendants of this project, right? And so you might think, okay, fair enough, they started food co-ops, big deal. And I would say, You're, what are you talking about, big deal? That is a huge deal. They, they were the precursor of every food co-op in the country. You know, and like this idea of a cooperative, I went to a co cooperative nursery school, you know, like there, there's other ways that that idea can be extended. So, and they also did other stuff, right? So they had free medical care. So that became the Haight-Ashbury Free Medical Clinic, which is like a, probably the best known free medical clinic in the country. Um, and the Haight-Ashbury Free Medical Clinic does research. They did pioneering treatment around addi addiction and free needle exchange. Um, and the concept of a free medical clinic is so popular that on the frequently asked questions on their website is how do I start a free clinic in my community? And so this extended into other free clinics, right? So free stores are still a project that artists will pick up and do it again. Um, I could go on about all the legacy, but this is a, um, this is a picture of a food co-op in Tucson that I, I took this picture, I was in Tucson, and I was like, they named the food crop after the food conspiracy. Like this, it's still a tribute to it, right? And you can go, next time you're in Tucson, you can go to the food conspiracy food crop. So you might be thinking, okay, that's a long time ago, but what about today? Um, and I'm gonna show you a project that we worked on at the center. So we do research, we do these workshops, and we do mentoring with, um, organizations that are trying to get stuff done, that are trying to get real outcomes. So the thing I'm working on, the reason I'm flying to Seattle tomorrow, is um, we've been working on the opioid crisis there. And so the outcomes are really specific. They're, you know, there's some big broad goals, which is like to have people that use drugs be treated as human beings and to be um, offered care instead of criminalized and things like that. 
But there's some real things, which was like, one we worked on was opening a supervised consumption site for people that use heroin and methamphetamine, which means that if you use, you can go to this place. There is someone on staff that will provide you with clean equipment, so sterile stuff, so you're not gonna get an infection. They will um, watch you as you inject and make sure you're doing it safely, and even teach you how to do it right if you're not doing it right and then monitor you to make sure that you're not gonna overdose. And then once they see that you're not gonna overdose, they kind of let you go. Um, and then while you're there too, they can say, hey, by the way, is today the day that you wanna quit? And if they say no, they say, okay, we'll see you tomorrow. And then they ask again, right? So there's access to services. Now, if you're like me, you're like, that sounds like a good thing, right? Um, I always think of like the 12 step program and the first step is admitting you have a problem, but really there's a step before that. Step zero is stay alive. And then you might be able to reach step one where you realize you have a problem. Um, and so this keeps people alive long enough so that they can access these other treatments. Yet it is controversial because uh, if you frame it another way, it's like, wait, we're gonna take city money and help people use heroin? No. You know? so, um, so we mostly overcame that in Seattle. We got the city to allocate money. Um, and one of the things that we did was we created this site because the city agreed they should do it. They came up with this um, recommendation to open these spaces on September 15th, 2016. I took this screenshot. We made this site. So on August 18th, a hundred or a thousand and sixty-seven days had passed, and in that time, around one thousand one hundred fifty-four people had died. So, if you go to the site, it updates every day, and it uses the, the statistics from the previous years to figure out a pretty close estimation of the number of people that have died. And we're really pressuring the mayor to act on this, to spend the money to open the space to take action. Right? This site is made mostly for the mayor. <laughs> And at the end, there's, um, it says like for people like Robert, and there's a bunch of people on there. This is a woman named Shira, and um, they, people write memorials for people that have died in that, in, in that area around that time. Um, so we set this up and encourage people to talk to the mayor about it um, and to put a little bit of pressure on the mayor. And, and it, we were hopeful, um, but a lot of time went by and the mayor still has not done much. And so what we wanted to do, because the mayor is on our side and they've made this recommendation, they sort of are in agreement. One thing we could do is like make a bunch of posters where Mayor Durkin is like a skull and she's, you know, the mayor of death and um, really try to shame her and stuff. But then we alienate her, she's less likely to do this. So we had to figure out a way of like pressuring her without pressuring her. So how do you do that? How do you make an artwork that does that? So this took a long time of thinking, and what we did was we um, built these giant numbers with holes in them. So there's two layers that go together back to back, and then um, and stand vertically like this. And then we bought these shipping tubes, and we put the shipping tubes in the holes, and then painted the whole thing white. Part of the reason we made it like this is because we were trying to do it sort of affordably and make it transportable and make it safe so it would stand on its own because it was, we, we were getting a space in front of Seattle City Hall. And we figured out the number of people that had died in the city of Seattle between when this recommendation was made and the day that we installed this. Um, we had to, the organization that I was working with eventually had to sue the city for the right to put it in front of City Hall. Um, they did not like the idea of this, but it looks so pretty. And so um, we had this big event where people came and they put flowers for friends that had passed away. They put in pictures and notes. And, um, and then the city put a note on it that said that it had to be taken away or it would be thrown out. So the organization sued the city again. Um, and like, meanwhile, the, the, they're suing, they're, or they're making it very difficult for us to do this, but like the mayor is standing in front of it and making announcements and things now. Um, so, 
they told us that we had to have someone standing in front of it, watching it and monitoring it 24 hours a day so it would be safe. And I'm like, it's cardboard. Like, it's not gonna hurt anybody, you know? But it was really just to make it more difficult. And the organization that we're working with is called Public Defender Association. And they do a lot of work with people that don't have homes. And the city at night is a homeless shelter, which is like this really awesome thing that this progressive city does. Is the city hall, when at, at, at the end of the day, whenever all the city people leave, they open the doors and let people in to stay overnight. So uh, because they organize with those um, people that don't have homes, they said, hey, you know, we're working on this project. You probably have some friends that um, have, have you've lost to overdoses. Any of you guys want to be the monitor for this overnight? And of course, like, yeah, I'll do it. And so we had people monitoring it 24 hours a day. Um, and one of the things we planned that the city didn't know is that we made four numbers. So about a month into it, and this was actually just last week, we took away the eight and brought in the four and updated it. So it was 540. Um, so this is like, these are pictures from this last week. And, um, you know, it's too early to say that we reached the outcome, but I think we did touch a nerve with the city and we did it in a way that I think was like um, respectful that made the emphasis on the cost instead of, you know, shaming this one person. And hopefully it will motivate them to um, do more and prevent some of these deaths. Um, that's just one example, I could show you others, but um, I don't know how to keep it short. So um, the organization is called the Center for Artistic Activism. I can answer the questions you have, the site is there. Um, but yeah, what can, I, what can I tell you now? <laughs> Yeah. Is it um, mainly visual? You use mainly visual, or you mention as an example music and other things? Right. Yeah. Often, what we end up doing is more like some sort of experience. So, another good example: we've been working in the in Macedonia, which is a former Yugoslavia. Um, there's a lot of corruption and very anti-LGBT legislation. So one of the things we did was create a, another country, um, another new country within their country for a day called the, they're called the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, that's their official name. We made a new country called the Future Republic of the Former Republic of Macedonia, um, which was a country that existed in this park in like a very small space and uh, was based on love. And um, we handed out a new passport and had this place where people could hang out and talk to each other. And it was basically a place where you could be LGBT or whatever. And um, it was safe and cool and fun. And it was the most popular thing in that park that day. Um, and like families and big groups of kids would come through. And it's a very officially, like sort of officially homophobic place, you know? And we had this space happening where it was all fine and people would eventually realize like, oh, those two women are like holding hands. Okay. <laughs> you know, like it's not weird. It's here, it's normal, you know? And like, and then they would go back to their country at the end. Kind of like the free frame of reference thing, right? Um, it was actually, I think, I, had, I think it was a, there was a direct connection there. But um, yeah, it's like that kind of creating a temporary experience for someone, and it's often very utopic um, because we find that like talking about what's possible or how things can be better is a lot more motivating to people than talking about what's wrong, and then showing them that world and letting them feel it, right? The affect part. So I would say a lot of the stuff we do is more this experience than visual. But we're kind of, it comes from my practice and also just being practical is um, like deciding it would be only visual or only performance would just put a limitation on it. Like it actually a lot of times doesn't look like art. And the, the more disguised it is, is, sometimes the better it works, especially in repressive regimes where they don't 
if they, uh, if you can kind of get under the radar if it, if it looks like a street festival or, you know, um, I'm trying to think. And we worked in Russia. What did we do there? We were, oh, we had a, no, that, that looked weird. In, it was in St. Petersburg and uh, there was no public space. Like there's no, there's a park, and there's just very little public space and, the, and a lot of room for cars and stuff and there's these canals and we were, and we built a beach on one of the canals and then laid out there like it was a beach and swimwear and <laughs> with a tree and towels and stuff. And so it didn't look like art, but, and, and because people couldn't make sense of it, they had to sort of be like, well, what is this and why is this happening? In a way where if, it, if they recognize it as art, they wouldn't ask those questions. It's like, oh, it's artwork. It's our project, and you stop thinking about it. But if you can't figure out what it is, you're like, who made this, and why did they make it, and what are they trying to say, which is all the things you should be asking about artwork. But when you have it, when you can fit it in an artwork category, you don't think it in those things. Yeah? What was the final tally on the sign? The capitalism? True or false? Well, so I've shown that piece in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. um, in Times Square, capitalism lost. Like it was 600 people or something that said that it didn't work, and 500 or so that said that it did. Um, but like I showed it in Liverpool, and it just like people in Liverpool are very have realized what has happened to them. And they're like, capitalism does not work. You, know, you can just walk around this city and see. Um, so yeah, it depends on the place. And I showed it in the Netherlands, and they're like very smart. They, they're like, yeah, it does kind of work for me. I don't feel good about it. <laughs> you know, but it does. I have to say it does. There's like this guilty awareness that they have. Any other questions? Tell us a little bit about the nature of this space. We're new, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. But, Is it um, related to your art and what you do? Or? The guy to talk to is Tom oh. there in oh, a gray okay. shirt. Oh, okay. And I'm sure we'll have time to chat. Oh, okay. I wish I could tell you, though. Oh, that's all right. Just it's curious. great, though. Let's all agree that it's great. It's <laughs> great. <laughs> okay. Did you have a question? I was going to ask, um, do you think it's like really or like helpful to like get like make it very interactive so that people like, like just like get more interested. Like yes. if you put flowers into the numbers, for example. Right, right, right. It's a beach, they're so like, oh I can lay on this. Like I think that's just like a huge draw. Because people are just like, I oh that looks interesting. I wanna be in there. Yeah, so there's two things. One is like lowering the barrier to participation. And often we think like, oh, you gotta make it super easy. It's not necessarily about making it easy. Like figuring out whether or not capitalism works in your life is hard. And, and that's why we don't think about it very much, you know? And people are often, when I talk to them, you can just hear how they're like, you know, try to answer a simpler question, like does capitalism work around the world? And it's like, well, that's easy, you know? And we can talk about that a lot, but what about you? And they're like, oh God, okay. You know, so, but the way that you make that easier for someone to participate in is by making it into a giant spectacle and it's sort of fun and relieving the pressure with some jokes every once in a while, making them feel comfortable. And then there's a whole process of leading them to the point where they're having that conversation that is also meant to bring down the barriers. Um, so like with the flowers and the notes and stuff, that's a different kind of, participation and it involves like organizing in advance, but do you want to help participate in this artwork? And people are like, yeah, but if you ask them to make something, that's a big ask and it's hard to do, but it's like, can you bring a flower? Can you bring a note? That makes it easier for them to participate. And there's a lot of like psychology stuff that we actually research and think about this work, how you move that person from an early first step to becoming more involved and more active and and so that they're the first thing is really easy and then and then there's a way for them to sort of move up the ladder you know but the other part about the interactive thing is 
that that's how we learn, you know? Um, like this format actually isn't the best for learning because <coughs> it's a lecture and I'm just speaking and you're listening. Um, I had tried to make it interesting with some stories and jokes and pictures, but, um, but the way that often we learn is like a back and forth and, and um, like truly interactive things are something where you, act, you asked me a question just now, I heard your question and I'm thinking about your question and responding to that question. And you heard what I said and you're thinking about it and responding. So it's a process of listening, thinking, and then responding. And if you take out any one of those, then you get this sort of more like computer interaction thing where like, you know, I can press a thing on my phone and it kind of, in a way, it's listening. It's not really thinking what I'm about what I'm doing in any deep way. And the response is a set of canned responses. There's only a few things that it will do. Um, and so it's interactive, but not like two human beings talking, you know? And so that's the standard and that, um, the more you can do that, the more you can sort of help people through a process where, this is the other piece, and then I'm gonna stop talking, is um, that what you want from people when you're trying to have a political outcome or, and actually change things is behavior. So behavior is the most important thing. So behavior means voting a certain way or voting at all. Behavior means, um, uh, could mean like doing something for their own health, like wearing a seatbelt or um, not smoking um, or eating a certain way. Behavior in um, Macedonia around corruption could be like speaking up when you're in a situation where there is corruption happening and talking about it, that that is part of what starts to erode that and change the culture. So we always think in terms of behavior because then then, you, then things change. If you, um, like my, the thing that artists say a lot, and you actually said in the intro is like raising awareness, and raising awareness is important, but if you have raising awareness without action, it's, uh, you gotta go for behavior. <laughs> so, um, yeah, anything else? Are you trying to get this message into our schools, our academies, the idea that our people are intimately bound to activism? I try a bit, but number one is like activists in the field. So it's really like gratifying to work. We've worked with like, you know, these anti-corruption folks in Macedonia. We're working in West Africa. I worked with sex workers in South Africa. And, people that are trying to change the education system in the South and stuff. And like they hopefully like put it right into practice. Um, we're, we're, we've made a book, hopefully it'll come out next year. Um, and you know, the school part over the years has become, it's like it's nice, but there have been times where it's like, do you want to give a lecture at this college or do you want to, I have to pick between that and going to work with trans healthcare activists in Romania. It's like, gonna go to Romania. <laughs> you know? So um, maybe someday we'll be able to, I don't know, I think it's leaking into schools though. I think that there's like social design is a thing in schools now that talks about this and it's making its way and we're having our effect slowly but surely. So we use the word we. Who, yeah. is, who are the collaborators? So um, there's a few of us. Yeah. That, it, we, it's a nonprofit, oh, okay. and um, there's three of us uh, that are full time and one part time person. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Great. Good work. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's all hang out. <laughs>